Thank you for coming. I know it was short notice for some of you. Um, so my name's Alicia. I work at Chedden Physiotherapy and Sports Clinic, actually just around the corner here. Um, so although we're primarily an orthopedic clinic, I've been lucky enough to study some BPPV and other vestibular rehab. It wasn't really until I started treating this that I realized how big of an issue it is. And getting some feedback from physicians in the area, people weren't really sure where to send these clients that come to them complaining of dizziness. Um, so it's a real kind of niche that I've created and not a lot of people in Oakville treat it. So I think it's important just to get the information out there about what it is we're looking at and what we can do about it. So to give you a quick overview, today we're going to be talking just a really quick overview of the anatomy of the vestibular system, more specifically BPPV. We'll do a demonstration of assessment and treatment because I think that's really the best way to understand it is to see it happening. We'll talk quickly about some other vestibular disorders. We'll talk about treatment for those other vestibular disorders, including unilateral vestibular lesions and bilateral vestibular lesions. Quick summary, and then at the end, we'll have time for some questions. So by way of introduction, dizziness accounts for 10% of all physician visits. And that number skyrockets when you're looking specifically at the elderly population. Um, for any of you that have experienced dizziness or vertigo, you know it can be absolutely debilitating. People come into the office, they complain they can't get out of bed, they complain they're nauseous, they can't go to work, they feel unsteady on their feet. This is particularly important for the elderly population. They already have so many extra risk factors for falls, then add dizziness on top of that, whereas dizziness is something we can, you know, we can treat, we can help with to help decrease that fall risk. Sorry, my curse is not working very well. So in terms of some terminology that we're going to use, dizziness is used to describe a variety of sensations. So dizziness and vertigo are not interchangeable. Dizziness is that swaying feeling, kind of off balance. Sometimes people will describe a, a stuffed ear, um, whereas vertigo is very specific. It's the illusion of movement occurring in the environment. So this is the people that come in and they say the room is spinning or there's objects moving. And nystagmus is another term we're going to use when we talk more specifically about BPPV. So that's that involuntary, quick, beating eye movement. Causes of dizziness range the whole gamut. And uh, that's why it's really important, I think, for individuals to see you guys first to kind of be able to rule out some of the other causes of dizziness. Uh, you know, our cardiovascular system, something as simple as orthostatic intolerance and, um, you know, stroke is a big one. Neurological dysfunction, we see dizziness in individuals with MS. Visual system can play a big role in that processing and then the dizziness and balance. We can have psychogenic dizziness, usually associated with mood disorders or anxiety. And then we can also have our vestibular disorders, which is what I'm going to talk in depth about today. So just a picture here, we've all seen this before, the anatomy of the, vestib the peripheral vestibular system. Um, just take a quick note of the position of the anterior, posterior, and horizontal semicircular canals here. When we talk more about BPPV, the angle of those canals, and specifically how different the angle of the horizontal canal is, that's going to make a difference for how we treat um, BPPV. The, the uh, vestibular system innervated by the vestibular branch of cranial nerve 8, and it's usually the superior division of that nerve that's most on, uh, often affected by viruses and infections. So BPPV, benign proximal positional vertigo. It's a huge mouthful, so we're just going to call it BPPV. Um, it is the most common cause of vertigo coming from the vestibular system. Um, most people will come into your office, they're going to complain a vertigo, oftentimes nausea, and they're going to complain that they feel it when they're bending forward to pick something up, um, looking up, so either washing their hair or picking, you know, getting a cup out of the cupboard. I find hairdressers and dentists pick this up a lot because that's the position you're in when you go to see them. Um, rolling in bed is another kind of big key symptom that every time they move in bed, the world spins. They go to lie down, the world spins. They wake up in the morning, they try to get out of bed, and the world spins. So in terms of mechanism for BPPV, unfortunately, it's, it's 
not as well understood as it could be. Uh, we know that otoconia end up in the semicircular canals. We think that it comes from the utricle going into the semicircular canals. However, these little crystals are so small, they're actually very hard to image. So some of this and some of the theories behind it are still hypotheses. Um, but even though they're hypotheses, treatment, assessment work really, really well. So what happens is these oviconia, which are a normal part of your vestibular anatomy, end up in the semicircular canal. When you move your head, those otoconia crystals move as well, and they excite the vestibular system. So they excite, overexcite those receptors, and it becomes misinformation, creating the sensation of vertigo or the room spinning. So it is the most common, or it's most commonly idiopathic, but we found that it can follow head trauma, ear infections, and anecdotally, I'm finding that a lot of people will come in after air travel, and that seems to stimulate it as well. Most of these people are going to get better on their own. About 50% of cases are going to have spontaneous remission within about two weeks. But two weeks is a very long time to feel dizzy, very long time not to be able to go to work, not to be able to care, to, care for your children, not to be able to drive. So if we can get these people into the clinic immediately, we can make them feel better that same day. So the big thing with BPPV that you're not going to see in some of the other causes of dizziness and vertigo is nystagmus. Nystagmus is always present in BPPV. So to do an assessment actually takes very little time. I'm going to use my colleague Dana Clark as our model. So Dana, if you want to come up to the front. So what we need to do is we need to figure out which canal is affected. And to do that, we can look at the direction of the nystagmus and if there's a torsional component. And then we can test using the dix hall pike and the head roll test. So the dix hall pike is the one that most people have heard of before. So Dana, if you can get in long sitting facing that way. This table is not the most stable, so I'm not going to do the technique as fast as we normally would. Uh, so what I do first is I always explain to the person, this is going to bring on your symptoms. You're not going to feel great. Don't worry, it will go away. Just try to stay in the position. For, so for the Dix Hall Pike, this is going to confirm or deny whether we have BPPV, and it's also going to tell us which side the BPPV is on. What it's not going to tell us is which canal. So first, um, through my subjective information, I've already determined which side. People, people usually know which side is the problem. They'll say, oh, every time I turn to my left, every time I turn to my right. So I will test the least provoking side first. So let's say for Dana, it's his left. So I get him turned 45 degrees to the left. And I ask him just to hold on to my arm here and here. This is just so that people don't throw their hands out backwards as I bring them down on the table. And I'm going to say, keep your eyes open, looking at me. Don't move out of the position. Even if you feel sick, stay there. Otherwise, we have to do it again. So we're going to go down really quick. One, two, three, go. So in this position, now you can put your hands down. So he's 30 degrees of neck extension and 45 degrees of rotation. I'm looking for nystagmus, and I'm looking for symptoms. So as you can see, I probably should have gone down even quicker in an elderly population this isn't going to happen. So you're going to go down as quickly as you can for patient comfort. If I have to do it two times to get quick enough to reproduce symptoms, especially with elderly that are going to guard and that are going to fight me the whole way, you, know, you, you make do with what you can. So if there's symptoms here, plus nystagmus, always nystagmus, then that's a positive test. So Dana can set back up, and we would test the other side. So let's say he has a positive test. He's got nystagmus on the, let's say, the left, but not the right. We know that the, right, or the left ear is the problem, but we don't know which canal is the problem. So then we're going to do the head roll test. That's just a, a picture of your Dix Hall Pike. The head roll test, this picture is a little bit misleading. I'm sorry, I couldn't find a better one. This shows the neck extended. Actually, the neck is flexed. So you're going to lie back, and you can scoot down so you don't actually hurt your neck. <laughs> so in this test, we're going to differentiate between the anterior and posterior semicircular canals and the horizontal canals. If you can remember back to the image of the, uh, the anatomy of the vestibular system, that horizontal canal was in a totally different plane. So the anterior and posterior canals, you're going to have a positive Dix-Hall pike, but a negative head roll test 
Whereas with a horizontal canal BPPV, you're always going to have a positive on both sides for the head roll test. So the head roll test is fairly easy. We're just going to go quickly to one side, again looking for nystagmus, looking for symptoms, and then same thing to the other side, looking for nystagmus, looking for symptoms. So if he had bilateral symptoms, then we know it's the horizontal canal. So bilateral symptoms, horizontal canal, only one side, then we're in our anterior or posterior canal. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes? Okay. So Dana, you can stay there. So with those two tests that only take about 10, 15 minutes, we've discovered, it, yes, is it BPPV? Which side is the lesion on? And which canal is the lesion in? So after we do that, we can move straight into treatment. So there's two different techniques that I use commonly in my practice to, for canalith repositioning. The Epley maneuver is probably the one that most of you have heard about. It is for the anterior and posterior semicircular canals. And what essentially you're doing is you're bringing those otoconia through the semicircular canal and back to where it should be so it's no longer creating that excitatory response. So the, the course that I took to learn this material was done by a gentleman um, from out in Vancouver. He treats only dizziness now. He found in his practice that holding each position for two minutes is the optimal time um, as it really allows everything to move. Chances are you don't just have one crystal loose, you've got a number of crystals loose. So if you hold the position, it allows everything to come through that range and go back to where it should be. Also, if there's any debris that's adhering to the wall, it will allow gravity to overcome that debris and pull it down into where it should be. So to do the Epley maneuver, you're going to always start on the problem side. So for Dana, we said it was his left side. Um, 45 degrees. I'm not going to make him come off the edge of the bed right now because I'm going to be talking and he's going to be there for a while. Um, but at uh, our clinic, we have a plinth that the head would extend 30 degrees. And if at home they're doing it, they can simply tip their chin up to reproduce about 30 degrees of extension. So he's in 45 degrees of rotation towards the affected side and 30 degrees of neck extension. He's going to hold this position for two minutes. It's very exciting. So now we're going to switch 45 degrees the other direction, same thing, 30, 35 degrees neck extension. These two positions, they're going to feel some symptoms, but generally it's going to subside fairly quickly. They're not going to feel too nauseous. They're not going to feel like they want to get up off the table. The third position is typically the most provoking. So before I get people into that position, I often warn them, you're going to feel yucky. You might feel nauseous. Don't worry, I haven't had anyone throw up on me yet. Try to stay in this position for as long as you can. So you're going to get them to roll onto their unaffected side, the right side. And as they do, I'm going to move their head as they go. What you want to do is maintain that 45 degrees of rotation, essentially looking into the bed. Again, we're going to hold this position for two minutes to allow everything to move through the semicircular canal back to where it should be. So the last position for the Dix Hall Pike is probably the most important. What you're going to do is you're going to get the individual to bring their knees up off the edge of the bed. You're going to tell them that they want to keep looking at that spot on the bed, keep maintaining that 45 degrees of rotation. And you're going to push through your hand and your elbow, and we're going to come up into sitting. Go ahead. Good. So Dana should have kept looking over his shoulder the whole time until I asked him to come back to the middle. He's not a very good patient. So again, I always stand right in front of the person and ask them to come back to normal. Stand right in front, usually with my hands on, on their shoulders. Um, if we had a bed that went up and down, I would try to put it so their feet are firmly on the floor. Again, they might have symptoms in this position. Once symptoms have resolved, we can retest our Dick's Hall Pike to see if we've got everything. If they go down into the Dix Hall Pike, no symptoms, no nystagmus, BPPV is gone, they're ready to go home. If they have diminished symptoms, but they're still there, I'll do two or even three passes of the Epley maneuver um, before sending them home. So that's again for anterior and posterior canals. 
not effective if it's horizontal canal BPPV. So this next um, treatment or candle three positioning is affectionately called the barbecue roll because it kind of looks like a rotisserie. So this is for the horizontal canal only. We're going to move through 360 degrees of head rotation in 90 degree increments. So you're going to have the person inside lying towards the affected side. You're going to wait for symptoms to pass and then another 30 seconds. Then you're going to get them on their back. So a 90 degree turn. Again, wait for symptoms plus another 30 seconds. Then on to the unaffected side. Wait for symptoms to pass, another 30 seconds. Now the last position is the most difficult, especially for our elderly population. We want the person to be in prone. So Dana, being somewhat young and healthy, can go on to his stomach no problem for the last position. If it's an elderly individual and they cannot get on their, fully on their stomach, sometimes I'll get them in half side lying and then twist their head so that they're getting that relative position without having to get into an uncomfortable body position. Then same with the epley, the way that you get out of the technique is the most important. For this one, you want to come up on your hands and knees. Again, for a dizzy person, you want to be right next to them, making sure that they feel stable. Um, if someone's doing this and they're really off kilter, I might get an assistant to stand on the other side just so, again, the person feels very safe. And from here, they can come into sitting however they like. And that's the technique. So again, these techniques only take about 10 minutes, and you only have to do one to three passes. Sometimes when you retest your Dick's Halpake and your head roll, even after doing it three times, you might still get a mild positive test. Some of the research shows that um, it takes a while for those receptors in the inner ear to kind of settle down even after that debris has gone. Uh, for instance, yesterday I had a gentleman in, um, he was complaining of vertigo that started on Sunday. He'd had it before, I'd seen him actually almost a year ago for the same condition. We did three passes of the Epley. When he sat back up, he was still a little uneasy. Um, we went back into the Dix Hall Pike to retest. I saw maybe slight, slight, slight nystagmus and he had mild symptoms. And I thought, okay, well we've already done it three times. I know his history, he's responded very well to treatment in the past. What we'll do is send him home and see how he does. And he emailed me this morning, symptoms had resolved. So even if you do three Epley maneuvers or three barbecue rolls and there's still mild symptoms, it's better to just stop there and recheck with the person if you need to, rather than to keep them spinning and spinning and spinning. Okay, so now what? As I mentioned, I like to follow up with people via phone or email the next day. In physiotherapy, we have to be conscious of people's funding limits. A lot of the people that get BPPV are elderly. They may not have insurance coverage for physiotherapy. I don't want them to have to come into the office any more often than they really, really need to. So if I call them or get an email from them the next day to check on their symptoms, they might not have to come back to the office at all. I would say about 95 of the individuals I see, I only ever need to see them once, and then I've just touched base with them. I do send them home with a printout um, of either the Apley Maneuver or the barbecue roll, whichever one I've used, because we know that BPPV can only be treated during a symptomatic phase. So if the person, um, you know, if they're out and about or they're at home and they get, the, get BPPV, then they could read this page. They know what to do. They can try it on their own. At the bottom of that handout is my contact information saying basically, if you've tried this and it doesn't work, give me a call. Um, most people find that really helpful. The individual that I had yesterday, he said he did try it at home once, but he felt a little nervous, so he thought, oh, better, better to come back in and see me. But it's nice that they have it just in case, especially um, people that have any type of healthcare background. This individual was a dentist, so he did have a bit of healthcare background to kind of guide him. Now, a lot of old research used to say prevent, do preventative exercises with these people to prevent a recurrence. However, now it's showing that there's no real benefit of preventative exercises. So I don't need to send anyone home with things specifically for BPPV. There's also no real benefit of sleeping upright anymore, the research is showing. Um, 
so you don't need to go home and tell someone to sleep in the chair that night. They're already uncomfortable, just let them sleep in their bed. What we can do, however, is treat any residual balance issues. So if this person has had a longer episode of BPPV, then we can work on some of those residual balance issues, getting them doing some exercises at home or exercises in the clinic, just to make sure that all of those systems are, are back to where they should be. So that's the quick wrap-up wrap on BPPV. And then we'll talk, I think, about some other vestibular disorders. So other things that might come through your door, the unilateral vestibular lesions, so that's your neuritis and your labyrinthitis, can be acute or chronic. People are going to come in, they're going to complain of dizziness, they're going to complain that they can't focus when they move their head. The big difference between this one and the BPPV is going to be this nystagmus. So if there's no nystagmus, it might in fact be a unilateral vestibular lesion or UVL, not BPPV. So this one is still movement induced, so very, very similar, um, but this is one that's better treated with medication. So bilateral vestibular lesions, this is more your degeneration with age, you can get ototoxicity as well. Vertigo is going to be rare, because even though these people have an injury to their vestibular system, most of the time it's symmetrical. So if it's symmetrical, then they're going to maybe feel off balance, but they're not necessarily going to feel that sense of spinning or dizziness, because one side isn't different than the other. Meniere's, now this is a tough one. So these people are going to come in complaining of the ear fullness, tinnitus, fluctuating hearing loss. They're going to have vertigo and they're going to have some balance issues. However, all of the research is showing that vestibular rehab doesn't help these people unless there's permanent loss of vestibular function. So later in the course of their veneers. Um, the, the acute onset kind of more newly diagnosed veneers clients don't really, di don't really um, benefit from vestibular rehab. On the other hand, cervicogenic dizziness coming from the neck, um, although it's less common, easily dealt with with phys phys physiotherapy, excuse me, um, so these people are the ones that are coming in complaining of dizziness. There's no nystagmus, um, maybe a history of neck injury or very tight neck. Maybe they've slept funny and they've had dizziness ever since then. Um, those people will benefit from physiotherapy. Concussion, this is such a hot topic right now. And it's very common to see vestibular issues after a concussion. So when we're doing either the, the new impact test or the older SCAT test, and working with someone through their concussion, a lot of times it used to be, okay, well, ride a bike. If you can ride a bike for five minutes or 10 minutes with no symptoms, you're ready to go. However, what we're finding is when, especially with the kids in, in sport, they get back to their sport, and it's not the exertion that's bothering them, it's everything going on in their periphery. So if they are still having symptoms on return to sport, it might not necessarily be that they need more time to rest, but rather that they need some physiotherapy to help reintegrate that system, some exercises that they can do either in the clinic or at home to help to get everything working again so they can get back on the ice or back on the field. So treatment for the UVLs and BVLs that we just talked about, two different types of treatment that uh, we would do in physiotherapy. We've got adaptation exercises and habituation exercises. So in adaptation exercises, what we're going to do is induce an error, and then that error can be processed and reduced by the CNS. So this would be an exercise where you give someone a spot to look at on the wall, and you say, focus your eyes on that spot. Keep your eyes focused on that spot, move your head, and they have to keep, continue to focus their eyes on that spot. So this exercise is going to be symptom inducing. So again, it's really important that we give people the information, especially if we're sending this as a home exercise, you're going to feel yucky. You're going to feel dizzy. It's okay. What we try to do is create an exercise program where symptoms are not going to linger any more than about a half hour. That seems to be a manageable time for people. And if people know beforehand that this is going to make them feel dizzy, they're better able to deal with it rather than if it's a surprise. Um, we've also shown that mental work or imagery can be helpful. So people that 
are really hesitant to do some of the head movements that feel so nauseous that they want to be sick to their stomach, mental imagery might be a place to start for them rather than going right into some of the, the head movement stuff. We also know that these exercises are context specific. So it's not good enough to have someone sitting in a chair and doing these head movements and fo focusing their eyes. Eventually, you have to progress them to the point where they're up walking. Uh, maybe you're getting them to walk and stop on the spot and then turn and keep their eyes focused. Or maybe you're getting them to get up from a chair. Different things that they're going to do day to day because you need it to be context specific. Habituation exercises, similar but not exactly the same. This one is going to be repeated exposure to reduce the pathological response. So typically with this, you want to do a series of between one and four provoking movements, and you're going to do them repeatedly. So if someone complains that getting out of bed is provoking and that they feel dizzy right away, you're going to have them get in and out of bed four times, sit and rest, and use that as an exercise. So in summary, BPV, BPPV is the leading cause of vertigo. This is going to be the most common one. Um, once assessed, it really only takes about 10 minutes for, for it to be treated, and then they're done. They don't have to come back to physiotherapy. Even if they have a uh, recurrence later on, they have their handout. They know what they can do. They know who they can call. Clients with UVL, BVL, concussion, other types of dizziness, they can benefit from physiotherapy. The only ones that really can't, at least in the early stages, are going to be those Meniere's clients. So thank you guys all for coming. I know, again, it was short notice. Um, here on the screen is my email address and our clinic contact information. I think everyone got a pamphlet and perhaps a referral pad too if they wanted it, if you think you might uh, see some of these clients in your practice. And does anyone have any questions this afternoon? Are you available Yes, actually thank you for bringing that up. Um, our receptionist at our clinic knows um, that this condition needs to be treated immediately. I'm usually fairly flexible. If someone calls that day saying they're having symptoms of BPPV, I'll usually come early or stay late or try to fit that person in to accommodate them. Because again, you can only treat it while they're symptomatic. So if they're symptomatic that day, you want to get them in the office right away. So if you see someone in your office, give them our card, give them the referral pad, tell them to call right then and there. We are open on Saturdays as well if anybody has a walk-in. So that's a good question. Um, he asked, the gentleman asked if we were covered under OHIP. Um, our clinic is not covered under OHIP. However, um, we do try to accommodate people that don't have insurance coverage. And again, it's only one session that they're going to be coming in for. I've heard of other clinics in the area that tw uh, charge twice the amount their normal assessment fee for orthopedic injuries for BPPV because they know these aren't long-term clients. They know they're only one-visit clients. However, we charge the same amount as any other person walking through the door. So typically it's $80 for the assessment. $80 for the assessment. And again, if someone doesn't have insurance coverage, we can usually work with them to help reduce that fee if cost is the issue. Oh, yeah, but unfortunately, right now for physiotherapy in the community, uh, unless you're um, over 65 or under 19, uh, it's not covered. You don't see a lot of 19-year-olds or under 19 with this problem over 65 and lower occasionally, but for the most part, the people aren't covered under this regardless. Lower 65 by the pay some? At our clinic, they would pay, yes. There are OHIP clinics um, in the community. Um, however, I don't know of any that treat vestibular disorders offhand. There might be some out there, but I'm not familiar with them. Any other questions? Great. No problem. Thank you all for coming.